Hi there everyone, welcome back to Dandelion Delphi Tutorials. Today we're going to look at for loops. For loops allows us to execute code that we place inside of the loop multiple times. This would be the structure of the for loop. The top one here is looping with the variable k. So k is called my for loop variable. Then followed by an assignment statement from this number to that number and then it ends with a do. Make sure that you don't put a semicolon at the end there as it then won't execute what you wanted to execute inside of the loop. So that what will happen in this for loop is k will start at 1 and then it will change the next time it loops to 2 and then to 3 and then to 4 up to the number that the user entered in iRandom or maybe iRandom was stored above this loop as a random generated number using random range. If I want to loop backwards, I still follow the same part here at the front, 4k is assigned to, but now I'm putting the bigger number at the start and I'm replacing the 2 with a down to 1 do. That means that k will start at 100 and every time it loops it will then be one smaller. So if I should display k for this bottom for loop, I would see the numbers 100, 99, 98 all the way down to 1. There are a few things you need to know about the for loop variable. The for loop variable in this case is an integer. And it can only be an integer or a char data type. You may never declare your for loop variable as a global variable. And then you may not make a change to that for loop variable inside of your loop. So you can't make a change to k, you can't ink a k inside of your for loop as it is being used as your for loop variable. Very important when you are using a two that the smaller number goes in the front and the large, larger number goes second. The first number, the smaller one here, is called my lower boundary and the larger one is called my upper boundary. If I want to loop in reverse, starting with a higher one, I have to use down to one. So in this case, the upper boundary goes first and the lower boundary goes second. Let's then take an example of trying to loop from 1 to 0. My loop will not execute at all, it will not give me any error, but it won't execute since I can't loop from 1 to 0, since 0 is smaller than 1. The same goes for down to. If you wanted to loop from 1 down to 100, your loop won't execute, as with down to, the upper boundary must go first. When I'm using my for loop variable and k is going to be an integer, these two values here has to be integer values. You will also note that there are no quotes around these values, whereas with chars that I'll show you just now, we need to put quotes around the upper and the lower boundary. My for loop variable can also be a char data type, but in this instance I will have to put two chars for my upper and my lower boundary. In this case, I want to loop from A to Z. Since A has a lower value in the ASCII table, that will have to go first if I'm using the 2. Make sure you put your quotes around each of these characters. And this for loop will now run from A to Z, changing from A to B to C to D and so on. If I wanted to loop in reverse, I could start at the higher value, which is lowercase z, down to a. Remember that capital A and lowercase a do not have the same ASCII value, and that capital A has a lower value than lowercase a. Go and Google the ASCII table and have a look. If your for loop had more than one line of code to execute on the inside, you will have to use a begin and an end after the do. Here are some examples that are allowed and that are not allowed on the inside of the loops. We're taking the example of where we're looping with the for loop variable k. 
I may use k inside of an if statement to test, in this case, if k is a multiple of 3. I can also use my k on the right-hand side of an assignment statement to perform some calculation and store that as a variable in an assignment statement. What I may not do with k is I may not change k. So you cannot have k on the left of an assignment statement. You also can't make a change by using it in the INC procedure. If c was my for loop variable that has a char data type, I could use it to test if that specific character was a character from A to Z and then do something with it. I could also output that C. K can also be displayed in a label or maybe in a rich edit would make more sense since we want to display multiple times. And I will then just have to add into string of K on inside of the brackets of that rich edit. What I may not do with my for loop variable this, in this case C, a char data type, is make a change to it by assigning it to another variable or using it in ink. In both instances of using a for loop, regardless of whether it is an integer or a char data type, your lower and upper boundaries may be input from the user or otherwise just values stored as variables inside of this for loop heading. These variables can also be replaced with functions or operator as long as they produce the same data type as your for loop variable. So if we take the integer for loop variable, we can maybe loop from 1 to the length of a string using the length function here on the right. We may also use the operators mod div and the function trunk, round, seal, month of and day of since they all are going to produce integer answers to us. This example is showing you how to count the number of multiples of 5 from the numbers 1 to 20. I have a for loop here running from 1 to 20, so every time that my loop executes, k will be changing from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. For all four of the first instances of k, the mod by 5 will not be equal to 0 because the remain there will be a remainder when I divide by 5. When k then changes to 5, 5 mod 5 will give me 0. And then I want to count that value because it is a multiple of 5. So now I'm going to use my counter and I have i count is assigned to i count plus 1. If you watched my previous videos, you would remember that I said if you are going to use a variable on both sides of the assignment statement, that that variable needs to be initialized. Up to now, you always initialize that variable in form on activate. But now when I have a loop structure, I have to initialize that variable directly above my for loop. Can you think why this is? This is because the person can click on the value on the button twice in which this code appears. The first time that the button was clicked, I count was zero, and now I counted for the for when k was 5, 10, 15, and 20, I counted the number of multiples of 5. So I count now had a value of 4 because there were 4 multiples of 5. Let's say I didn't initialize I count above this loop. And now the person clicked on the same button again. I count will now still be 4. And now I'm going to add another 4 to my counter. And now my counter is going to indicate that there are 8 multiples of 5 from 1 to 20. And that is clearly incorrect. So for that reason, we initialize directly above the loop. And since I'm now using this counter only inside of this button, it does not need to be a global variable. I will declare it as a local variable. The only instance in which you would have to declare I count as a global variable is if you had to display I count in another button or menu. Another rule to follow with for loops is that you may never use an exit inside of a for loop. Later we'll learn more about conditional loops and we will use a conditional loop if we want to make a loop stop at any point. This is an example of code that you have seen something similar of before but not using loops.
The question here is asking me to enter 20 learners' marks and then calculate their average and also displaying the lowest and the highest mark. So I have 20 marks to enter and therefore I'm using my for loop 1 to 20. Very important is when you want to get input from the user on the inside of a loop, you will have to make use of an input box. The user will not have the opportunity to change an edit box while your loop is executing. So for input in any loop, whether it is our conditional loops that we are doing next, or in a for loop, we are going to use an input box for input. Here I'm just adding the mark to a total to be able to calculate the average at the end. Remember the variable is on both sides of the assignment statement, and since I have a for loop, I'm going to initialize that variable above the loop. I total will now be a local variable. To store the highest mark and the lowest mark, I'm going to need this if statement at the bottom here that says if the mark currently entered is greater than i high, then store i mark as i high. But I have a bit of a problem because i high won't have a value the first time my loop executes. So for that reason, I'm starting here with my if statement to say if it if k is equal to 1, that really means that this is the first mark entered. I'm going to make that mark both the highest and the lowest mark. The next time my for loop executes when k is 2, it will not execute this part of the if statement because k is not equal to 1. Now it will execute my nested if inside of this else statement and compare the current mark to the previous highest one. If it is higher, it will store that mark as i high, else it will also check if the mark currently entered is less than i low. If it is, it will store the current mark as i low. This is now the end of my for loop. I'm going to calculate averages outside of my for loop because I first want to add all the marks together before I start calculating an average. Average will be real because I'm using the divide and I'm using this i total variable divided by 20 because 20 marks were entered. In this way, I can now display the highest mark and the lowest mark and the average outside of my for loop. Now is your time to practice. If you haven't done so before, go download the data files for grade 10 book from this link. Open the program in the for loop folder and try the even odd menu. Press pause and I'll show you the memo soon. The user is going to enter my lower boundary and my upper boundary. It is important that you store both of these as integers since I'm going to use a for loop with an integer for loop variable. We had to ensure that the lowest value was stored in i low and the highest value was stored in i high. So if i low is greater than i high, I then need to swap the values around in these two variables. As I explained in the user defined functions program, I'm going to start and end with a keeper and then I can follow with i high on the right i high then on the left giving the value of i low and then i low receives the value of what i kept in i keep now i'm going to loop with a an integer data type variable k from i low to i high as the user entered in my if statement here i am using the odd function to test if i if, if k is odd or even remember your if statement will automatically test if a boolean value is true but you can also add to this is equal to true that would mean the same thing and if it is an odd number I'm going to display the number in the rich edit with a hash 9 to make that tab stops and equal to odd if odd does not return a true that means the number is even and I'm just changing the label there to even now try the menu vowels and making use of a for loop variable that has a char data type and see if you can produce the output below. Press pause, try it and then watch the memo.
The input from the user needs to be stored as a char data type as that is what I'm going to use for my for loop. My for loop cannot make use of strings. Input boxes produce string data types and therefore I've added the square brackets one at the end to only copy out the first character and store that as a char data type. To ensure that they have entered the lower value in C low and the higher one in C high, I also do the same process as in the previous example, just using my char data types. Swapping the values in the variables around if C high has a lower value than C low. I was asked here to count the number of vowels between the two characters entered. So I'm going to initialize I count here above my loop and you'll also see that it is a local variable because I'm going to use ink I count. My for loop then runs from C low to C high and I'm going to test if the capital letter of that character is a value A, E, I, O, or U. I don't want my program to be case sensitive and therefore I've used upcase here. I then display the character if it is a vowel and I count it. And outside of the loop, I'm just displaying how many I have found and what the input from the user was from one value to the next. Important that you put this outside of your loop because you don't want to display while you are counting. You want to display when you are done counting. This is the last example from my textbook that I'm going to show you, but there are many more to practice. So go to the menu Perfect Square and try the following. Press pause and code it yourself before you watch the memo. So I have declared my for loop variable as k as I was supposed to loop from 100 to 300 and display all the perfect squares from 100 to 300. Inside of my for loop I now have an if statement to test if the square root of k is equal to the rounded value of the square root of k. If you take an example for let's say 16, I know 16 was not part of this loop but 16 is a easy one because we all know it's a perfect square. The square root of 16 would be 4. The rounded value of the square root of 16 will also be 4. So since I have the same answer on both side, sides, it is a perfect square. But if you take a value like for example 17, the square root of 17 will not be the same answer as the rounded off value of the square root of 17. Since square root of 17 will give me some decimal places, whereas the rounded value will have no decimal places, and then it won't be displayed because it's not a perfect square. All you had to do here is display the k, which would be the perfect squares from 100 to 300 only. Thank you guys for watching Dandelion Delphi tutorials. Make sure you go and practice the other for loop activities as well in Dandelion Delphi book one. Hope to see you soon.